This Week in Agribusiness, serving America's most essential industry, is brought to you by Case IH. Coming up on this weekend's broadcast, access to credit is among the concerns of those working in Washington on the behalf of farmers. Oh, and that organic crop market. It's not hot as a pistol anymore. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the broadcast. Yes, Mr. Mike Pearson is away this weekend, so they brought me back in here. Mike will check in in just a few minutes. He'll have a report from the Organic Crops Summit held in California this past week, and there's a lot on their agenda. Speaking about a crowded agenda in Washington, of course, they went ahead and extended the farm bill, but there's much more that they are devoting attention to these days. We heard about that with a man with the American Bankers Association. Ed Elfman talked with us about everything that's a concern to his group, especially that area of credit. I asked Ed, how do you get things done? How do you accomplish anything these days, especially in the sector of agriculture, trying to work in a very divided Washington? You have to build relationships. That's such a big part of working in D.C. Get to know people, get to understand where they're coming from. And then the beauty of working on agriculture in D.C., people are from everywhere in the country and have different interests. Go talk to a California banker. He has a very different world than my bankers in North Carolina or bankers in Illinois. So it's a fun part of the, the life, actually, to get to know all those different parts of ag. What are some of those issues hanging out there yet that need to be tended to, especially as we look toward 2024? So when we look at Farm Bill and things going on with Farm Bill, we just had a one-year extension come through, which is fine, right? At least we got some certainty for the next year, especially on the loan program side, we need the certainty. What we're looking at getting into a long-term Farm Bill is increasing the guaranteed far, uh, farm programs at Farm Service Agency, both on the ownership side and the operating side, because the cost of agriculture continues to go up every single year. I don't know if it's ever gone down. Let's be honest about where we're going with ag and what it looks like. So from a banking perspective, increasing the guaranteed loan programs makes a lot of sense. Additionally, that helps our beginning farmers. Iowa and Missouri are trying to set new records for what it costs to buy land every single year. Used equipment costs as much as new equipment. We need to make sure that beginning farmers have the credit availability they need and that the programs work to help them. We do still see some first generation farmers out there. And I always, uh, my eyes always open wide, I think, when I see somebody, meet someone of that nature, they tell me, hey, I'm, uh, I'm a first generation farmer, because I know how difficult it is to get started. And there are some things that we can do at the national level to help them. Yeah, especially uh, beginning farmer programs at USDA, there's a lot of potential to build those out, make them easier to use. Simple things like what documentation you gotta show up with to make sure that you can get the loan put together, right? Educating our, our beginning farmers coming in. The other side of it, it's not just new folks getting into agriculture. Look at things like the farm was put in a trust and now there's 20 people involved in the trust. Trying to get a beginning farmer loan under current law, you can't lend against that trust unless you have the approval of every single person that's part of that trust. That's a barrier to entry for our beginning farmers and it's, I think it's a real problem. At the end of the day, we want beginning farmers to get into agriculture. We want them to be successful. I want them to become lifetime farmers. That's what we're looking for, right? Ed Elfman with the American Bankers Association said they are especially interested in getting passage of something called ACRE. It's the Access to Credit for the Rural Economy Act, ACRE. He says that would lower the interest rates for farmers who need to borrow. He said it would invigorate the economy in 17,000 rural communities. Ed Elfman, by the way, he works in Washington these days, but he told me he grew up on a dairy farm. He used to wrestle with cows on the farm in central Minnesota. This portion of This Week in Agribusiness brought to you by Firestone Ag. Today's larger, heavier equipment can lead to more soil compaction issues. Firestone Ag IFVF tires with AD2 technology maximize the load capacity while minimizing soil compaction. Visit FirestoneAg.com to learn more. Brian Basting joins us in the studio this weekend. Mr. Basting, good to have you back here. Oh, it's great to see you, Max, and good to be back. Advanced Trading is the firm headquartered in central Illinois, but you work with farmers, well, truly, I guess, and elevator operators all over the world now. Weather has to always be a, a major discussion. And I, I noticed the other day, I was shocked to see combines rolling already, harvesting soybeans in Brazil. And the, the farmer who posted that said he could not recall soybean harvesting in Brazil before in November. That tells us a couple of things, doesn't it, in terms of 
future crop production there. It certainly does, Max. There was an adjustment in the uh, timing of the planting window for the Brazilian farmers in Mato Grosso in the north. They were able to plant a bit earlier this year. I would say some of those beans in the north, Max, suffered the worst from the dryness in northern Brazil. But as you said, uh, they're harvesting in the north. In the far southern state, Max, of Rio Grande do Sul, they are still planting beans down there. So this is going to be a wide weather window for Brazil the next 30 to 45 days. That tends to spread out the risk, though. Uh, and it tends to spread out, I guess, one could argue, the possibility for market volatility and maybe, maybe, uh, farmer opportunity. Boy, you summarized that well, Max. I think farmer opportunity is the key word when you look at the soybean market. We're looking at some nice strength here as the year winds down, directly tied to those issues with Brazil. But I'd remind your viewers, defend your balance sheet because we're looking at the potential of a doubling of the crop size in Argentina next year. Recall that earlier this year, Argentina had a drought. So even if Brazil were to have a bit of a setback, Max, I'd remind your viewers, Argentina could double, could double their crop size with favorable weather in 2024. Of course, they have economic challenges in Argentina, and that could go one way or another. That's a whole other story. But if those soybeans get harvested early in Brazil, uh, that does leave opportunity, does it not, for that safrinha corn crop to get planted in a better fashion? A bit of a mixed bag there, Max. You hit the nail on the head that, that the early uh, harvested beans would open that window for safrinha corn. However, in other parts, Mato Grosso, the state is so large, mm -hmm. other parts of Mato Grosso were so dry, Max, that it delayed the soybean planting. So there's a bit of a concern in parts of Mato Grosso that the delay in soybean planting will lead eventually to a delay in safrinha corn planting in 2024. So it's such a large state that some of what you said is spot on. Some of that state though was a little bit delayed in their, in their bean planting. We get into this time of the year, we think about the opportunity maybe for a Santa Claus rally in the bean market. So I, the farmer, I think, uh, if I hear you correctly, should really stay on top. We get distracted sometimes in the holiday season, but marketing should not be neglected in the winter time, should it? Yeah, I think it's really critical, Max, that, that, that the producer looks at opportunities that are available today. We don't know what the market's going to do a week from now, much less a month from now. We do know today the market is strong. What we want to do is focus on managing price movement, not predicting price movement. No one can accurately predict prices over an extended period of time. Let's manage these markets, take advantage of them. Max, I don't think it's too early to think about 2024 also. November beans for 2024, right near $13 bushel. We have seen the dollar weakening here of late. That's, that's positive for exports. I guess, I mean, we're looking for any, trying to grasp any straw here, but after prolonged strength, the dollar has slipped back some. That makes our grain a little bit cheaper to the overseas buyer, does it not? It does, Max. A uh, good point. And, and at this point, the export market, particularly for corn, needs some assistance because we're looking at an exceptionally strong competition at the moment, historically strong competition from Brazil, not only in the soybean market, but Brazil is now looking more and more like they will be the top corn exporter in the world in 23-24. We want to talk with you a little more, sir, and tap your knowledge here. Thank you again you for being with us this weekend. Brian Basting with an advanced trading. He will be back momentarily. Today's larger, heavier equipment can lead to more soil compaction issues, producers. Firestone Ag IFVF tires with AD2 technology. Maximize the load capacity and minimize soil compaction. Visit FirestoneAg.com to learn more. Yeah, it's hard not to talk about the markets with Brian Basting without talking about weather as well. We'll talk with Greg Solier a little bit later on in the forecast. Drought monitor map, I noticed again, has very impressive geography in the United States in drought. Now, I know if you're, if you're worried about replenishing water supplies in a farm pond or having available water, it's a concern. To crops, does it really matter? I mean, I have to ask, after these recent yields oh of 2023, does the winter time soil moisture really matter anymore? You know, it's a great point, Max, because we certainly saw the corn and soybean yields respond to these uh, uh, less than favorable weather conditions. They responded to genetics in 2023. But back to your original question, I think we really have to highlight that out west, we had back-to-back -back droughts in Kansas, Oklahoma, tough wheat yields mm -hmm. out there. Much better looking on the maps at the moment, but right. we don't make a wheat crop in the first week in December, as your viewers all know. So it does matter. It's something we, we definitely want to go into the growing season in 2024 with a subsoil reserve, as it were. But boy, the, the, the best producers in the world, terrific land and genetics, Max, 
we'll, we'll take our chances with our producers in 2024. This winter when I'm sitting out in the shop with a few friends of mine and we're kicking the bucket out there, I'm going to, that's, that's not literally, <laughs> hopefully, <laughs> someone might argue, yeah, we're, we're getting, getting closer to it there. When we're really talking about this crop situation, and uh, Chad Colby and I were talking off the air a few minutes ago about these yields that occurred is it really going to minimize the opportunity for farmers somewhere down the road before long as traders will say, wait a minute, we can, we weatherproof this crop in the United States. We get lousy weather in June, day after day, week after week, and we still get tremendous yields. Have we, have we weatherproofed it? It's certainly uh, uh, something to be aware of in, in the context of, of the yields being much, the crops being much more resilient than they were five, 10, especially 15 years ago. However, I'd remind the viewers, Max, that the, the world markets now are so closely tied to price, whether it's what's happening in South America, whether it's ha what's happening in the Black Sea, whether it's what, what's happening in China. There are enough variables around the world, I think, Max, that price volatility, I think, is going to be with us for a while yet, and consumption continues to rise, too. You talked about those standout events that have occurred, and, and we can think about one, I guess, in about each of the last four or five years. What do you tell that farmer who's saying, all right, I'm holding on. There's going to be a big one in 2024. I'm just waiting for that one. What do you say to them? I think waiting may be a key word there, Max. And, and all we know today is what the market is offering. And the market is offering near $13 a bushel for new crop beans next fall, a tad over $5 a bushel for new crop corn for next fall. Uh, the price insurance period in terms of crop insurance will not be established until the end of February. So we still got basically uh, 90 days here where the markets can move. And what I'd remind your viewers is there's always that possibility out there, but let's look at what the market's mm -hmm. offering today. Let's avoid painting ourselves into a corner, give ourselves some upside, but opportunities can be present sometimes when we least expect them, Max. So yes, that's always a possibility. You want to avoid painting yourself into a corner, marketing flexibility, but always, Max, be on the guard to defend your balance sheet because I think uh, we're looking at potential for much larger crops, for example, in Argentina next year. Um, so flexibility, uh, leave the upside open. Uh, perhaps in my opinion, Max, a good, a good way to do that was to be a purchase support option. Yeah. In the final seconds here, uh, ahead of that supply and demand report coming up in the days ahead, what do you think we'll see there? Anything that might provide a kind of a lift at all? I think the focus, Max, South America, what USDA will do with Brazil uh, production. Also, Max, what USDA may or may not do with China. Finally, very importantly, will USDA continue to embrace its corn export forecast? Seems a bit optimistic to us at the moment. Good to see you as always, sir. Thank Great you, you. so much. I know it seems early to say so, but everybody's ratcheted up the holiday. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to you. Merry Christmas, Happy New Year to you and your viewers, Max. Thank you. Brian Basting with Advanced Trading. You can go to their website and see a lot of good information there, including Brian's weekly updates. Colby Ag Tech is brought to you by Copperhead Ag Products. Visit copperheadag.com for more information. Yes, he's come bearing gifts. I'll gladly accept all of these, sir. <laughs> we appreciate you coming by for suggestions. We all need help this time of the year. You know, I've had several phone calls this week. You know, what watch should I get my son? You know, all kinds of questions, because it's, it's truly hard to buy for your favorite farm and rancher. And we got a lot of viewers that really look forward to this segment every year. And I think this is maybe our fourth or fifth year we've done it. So, Max, it's exciting to, to share this stuff. And unfortunately, I might spend a little of your money here, too, because <laughs> you always seem to find something you might need, right? Great collection of books, and we recognize the source for those. OctanePress.com, our friend Lee Clauncher, who was in the other day. Uh, but it, he doesn't just have tractor books. There's more than that. Yeah, that's right. A couple books in front of you, Max. If you're a diesel guy and love Cummings engines and let the history of that, it's pretty fascinating. Obviously, there's books from John Deere. And one thing we always kind of overlook is the kids' books. Mm -hmm. um, I shared those with my girls when they were younger, and they loved them. And when I was packing to come up here, even my daughter Bristol said, Dad, that's one of my favorite books as we was putting it in the box. So he, it's pretty good. He even carries that Armstrong book. So keep that in mind when you visit OctanePress.com. You couldn't come in here without bringing in a drone, could you? Actually, no, I couldn't. This is really one of my favorite all-time drones. And I'll tell you why is this little guy right here, it's folded up now, but it weighs less than a can of Diet Coke. And it has more functionality than drones that we had 10 years ago that cost five or six grand. <laughs> And that's what's really nice. You don't use your smartphone anymore. You can see what you're seeing with the drone right on this controller. You can be airborne in 
30 or 40 seconds. It has all the automation max that you would appreciate, sonar so it won't run into things, auto takeoff, auto land, and most importantly, a great sensor to take a lot of those great scouting pictures or looking at your livestock or whatever you might need to do on your farm. I'm laughing because I remember when you pulled up in my house a little more than 10 years ago with the first drones, I think half of the bed of your pickup was covered with batteries and battery chargers. Max, it was terrible. <laughs> it was, it's different now though, isn't it? Yeah, that's what's nice about this system here. And, and, and the, the size of it is great too. Mr. Apple, I see you are going to take care of us in that regard as well. Well, I think it goes without saying, a lot of people are looking at the big items, the watches, the tablets, the phones. That's kind of a given every year. I like to look at those accessories and one of my favorites is the new Magic Keyboard. It's been around now for a year or so, but it's one of my favorites. Backlit keyboard, you can plug it in on the side here that'll charge it as well, and the tablet. It's got a trackpad like a laptop, and this is the best part. You don't need to do anything to make it work. It just magnetically clips on here. Same way with the new pencil, which is USB type C, so you can charge it there, or when it's hooked to the device, it can charge as well. And then you and I had this conversation recently. I texted you asking yeah. you for advice. <laughs> Bose has some real nice ones they're pushing, there's a lot they're of great, expensive, very there's pricey. A, well, all of these are a little salty AirPods. when it comes to money, but AirPods are great. And this newest version, it's got all the noise canceling and all the things we're used to, but it's also USB type C. Mm. So now it matches your phone, your tablet, it all ties together. <laughs> and you have something there for this season for farmers getting the combine ready to stick away in the shed. Get it in, in great shape. Several posts on the social media recently have noted that they want to have them nice and clean. You know, we've, we've been fortunate over the years to share at Farm Progress Show and here on the show products from Protect Systems. Um, Good stuff. Great, great stuff. And, you know, the soap to clean, and then they've got the specialty tools, Max, to make your stuff look good, but most importantly, the ceramic coatings to protect it. And Max, speaking of that, talk about something for, for you there this year, something you've oh, used recently. I tell you what, I, I have the most pedestrian pickup truck in our <laughs> county. It's 10 years old. I use this stuff and it looks brand new. I appreciate it. Wasn't sir. hard to do. Thank you, Santa. <laughs> Thanks for coming in. Uh, what's their website? If, they, uh, if you go to protectsystems.com. Protectsystems.com. Appreciate you so much. Happy holidays to you and Jackie. Closed captioning for this week in agribusiness is brought to you by Pentair Hypro, a global leader in innovative spray technology for farmers for over 75 years. Welcome back to this week in agribusiness. Fertilizer, getting the most out of that investment of those nutrients is on the minds of growers, it seems, at all times. Sherry Cook with Mosaic talked about that. She visited with Mike Pearson. Sherry, the fertilizer industry has been interesting over the past two or three years, to say the least, but that's commodity fertilizer. There's a difference in this industry. Can you talk to us a little bit about how you at Mosaic view commodity fertilizer versus, say, performance fertilizers? So performance fertilizers is our world, right? We, we started off years ago as our commodity company, and we still produce a lot of commodity products, but I look at commodity products as products that were developed in the 60s and the 70s. And today we have our performance products. So commodity products are products like MAP, DAP, where they have a couple of nutrients. Our performance products, we've added extra nutrients to that for the grower. We're seeing more deficiencies throughout the world. So for example, microessentials is one of our performance products that has sulfur and in some cases zinc. So we've added more nutrients to go out to the soil to go out for that, for that grower so that we can get that higher yield is what we're ultimately shooting for. And then on the potash side, because Mosaic's a phosphate and a potash company, we have an enhanced potash, the only one in the industry today that has potassium and boron. So it's how can we bring more to that grower and, and, and bring more to that soil profile. Sherry, that potash product, can you tell us a little bit more information? Yes, so our potash product is called Aspire and it's the only enhanced potash product on the market today, and it's potassium, and it's enhanced with boron. So boron is the number two most efficient micronutrient in the world today, and so we're trying to help our growers fill those needs that they have in the country. So we think about farmers getting that fertilizer applied, they've got their cycles, they've got everything they do to make it happen. What should they be thinking about as they're looking more long-term for full season, really, fertilization? Right, and we, we address those issues because one of the things that we try to address for our growers and for our customers is how can we have that season-long feeding because that growing plant, let's just say corn, for example, or wheat, 
it's taking in nutrients all year long. So it's not just getting it on in the spring and then we get a bunch of rain and we lose our nutrients. Our goal is to have that season long feeding, that, that complete crop nutrition. And so with microcentrals, for example, we have two forms of sulfur. And those plants take up sulfur throughout that entire year. And so we have sulfur throughout that first part of that growing season and then again throughout the second part of the growing season. And we see the same thing with our Aspire, with our potash product. We have two forms of boron in every single crystal, every single granule. And so that, that helps us ultimately maximize our crop and our yield. And so having, having that nutrient availability there throughout the season is a great win. It is, Sherry. Performance fertilizers, one way folks can achieve full crop nutrition all season. That's something you've been talking about. Where do you see it going from here? What's the next generation as you look out into the future? Lots of exciting things that are happening. And within Mosaic, for us, the, the most recent is, is dipping our toes, so to speak, into the, the biological world. And so it's been a buzzword for the last several years and we've decided to make that investment. How can we better enhance the products that we currently have today? And it's difficult to develop new fertilizers, right? And I've noticed that in my 12 years with Mosaic is they don't happen overnight. And so with the biological side, we're enhancing what we have in the ground. So it's not just helping that fertilizer be more available, but it's also helping those microbes that are in the soil. And there again, how can we improve what we have today? Sherry, biologicals. This is a word we have heard a lot. As you mentioned, in the past couple of years, they're coming on fast. We're seeing major players in the industry adapt to biologicals. For those of us who maybe haven't been paying too much attention, what does it mean, a biological, compared to a conventional fertilizer? What's the difference? So there are lots of biologicals out there, and Mosaic has focused on the biologicals that we can put into the soil that will enhance that nutrient uptake, that better crop nutrition is what we're aiming for. And with the biologicals that we have, two of the brand names today are Biopath and Power Coat. Biopath goes in with your liquid fertilizer as a starter or as a mid-row. And then we have our Power Coat, which we can impregnate onto our dry fertilizer. So for us, it's a great win because it enhances what we have today. It enhances what you have today. And I'm guessing from a sustainability standpoint, there are, imp there are advantages for using the biologicals. Absolutely. And from the sustainability side of things, we are ultimately the grower in the long term will most likely have to be careful how much product they put out. We're already seeing restrictions in certain states. We're already seeing some algae blooms and things where we have physical runoff. And so part of our goal with the biological side is to, can we decrease the amount of fertilizer that we put on? How can we enhance and maximize that crop nutrition to get the best usage of the nutrients we put out there? Spring will be here before we know it. That fertilization cycle will start again. Sherry, what should farmers be thinking about right now ahead of this next year's growing season? So for those of us in the north, we're still wrapping up our harvest, but I would say the first thing to do is do a soil test. That gives us a, a good a idea of where we're at today, what nutrients are left in the soil, and what we potentially have to put on. And so I would start with that. Visit with your agronomist, decide on seed varieties, decide on your herbicides and your fungicides. And so there's, there's lots of planning to do yet for the rest of the year. There certainly is, Sherry. If folks want to check out some of the mosaic products you've mentioned, where could they go to learn more? Best place would be cropnutrition.com. All of our information and our data about our products is at that website and we'd love to have people visit. Again, that website Sherry mentioned is cropnutrition.com. Our thanks to Mike for the visit. Mike will be along in the second half of this weekend's broadcast, talking about what's been going on in the organic foods market. This Week in Agribusiness, serving America's most essential industry, is brought to you by Case IH. Welcome back to This Week in Agribusiness. It's a pleasure to join you again this weekend here. Mike Pearson has not been at the desk this weekend because he was traveling. He was visiting with a bunch of producers of organic crops at a conference in California where they were talking about what is happening these days or maybe what is not happening, we should say. We're not seeing that continued dramatic growth in the market for the organic crops. Let's check in with Mike. 
Max, thanks for holding things down in the studio this week so I could come to Monterey, California to the Organic Growers Summit. 600 organic growers from across the western states gathered here this week to talk about the innovation and the changes in their sector of the ag economy. I had the chance to talk with Walt Duflock, the Vice President of Innovation with Western Growers, about why they've been a partner in this event for so many years. So we became the title sponsor of this show four shows ago. Uh, it's been a great partnership with Matt Seeley and the team. And the benefit to our Western Grower members who grow all the fruits, nuts, and vegetables is two days to focus on just the issues related to organic and put everything else to the side. So it gives them a place to listen to the thought leaders, the growers, the researchers, and the industry folks that are doing the work in organic, figuring out what's hot, um, what's not, what's maybe overhyped, um, and just two days of, of knowledge on that. So in that two days of knowledge, you had a chance to talk to growers from across the state and country, probably. Well, what is on their minds? What's hot in 2023 for organic growers? I think there's a couple topics to keep hitting the top of the top of the meter, if you will. Number one is um, what's going on with the organic growth rates. Uh, as an industry, you saw double digit growth year over year in organic sales in the 2010s until about 2019. Since then, we've hit a flat patch for the organic category as a whole for about five years. Now, there's individual crop types like strawberries that continue to do well and some of the leafy greens, but organic as a whole has slowed down. We're trying to figure out why and what to do about it. Some of that is probably consumer awareness. Some of it's probably retail buyer awareness of some of the challenges with organic production. And then the second hot topic is what innovations are out there that can help organic recreate some growth out of that, right? So some of it is we need more demand. Some of it is we need new innovation to grow organically better. That leads into the third topic, which is regenerative, sustainable, and organic have to somehow coexist in the minds of the retail buyer, and the consumer. We have a long way to go to get that right. That discussion's live and alive and well here. Well, those discussions that were happening, no doubt they'll continue on farms and ranches over the course of the next year. What do you think is going to be a bright spot as you look ahead to 2024 for the organic market? I actually think the organic market will continue to see growth in a couple of key categories. The, uh, the hotter categories, the strawberries and some of those leafy green categories. I think one of the real growth levers is what's called value added products. So if you think about the salad kits and all the snack kits that come out nowadays in Starbucks and in grocery stores and all that, um, the consensus is among a lot of folks in the leafy green industry and the fruit side that the value added kits will continue to grow. Um, here's an interesting stat. Um, 40 years ago, most of the lettuce left Salinas Valley as whole head product, um, and now that number is half and half. Half leave as whole head, half leave as bag salads. So that's tremendous growth in the bag salad industry. Taylor Farms, Fresh Express, Dole, and all the rest of them doing great work on packaged products. That's where we think the growth is in the value add side of the business. Yes, Max, lots of excitement down here in Monterey at the Organic Grower Summit. That was Walt Duflock, Vice President of Innovation at Western Growers. When you ponder the reason that that organic market isn't growing dramatically, you have to think about the consumer shock, perhaps, because of all of the inflation, all of the items that go into that uh, supermarket cart. And maybe there is some um, consumer backlash, perhaps, because of the inflation they are seeing. Greg Solier now brings us his farm weather forecast for the week ahead, presented by Pivot Bio Proven 40. Predictable, productive, weatherproof. Turn to a better nitrogen. Turn to Pivot Bio Proven 40. Learn more at pivotbio.com. He is here with us now to take us through the waning weeks of 23. And I noticed the other day a friend who is a rancher in Wyoming lamented the arrival of winter at his place. But it's time, isn't it? I mean, it'll soon be here on the calendar as well. Exactly. And they've had just little snippets of it. But this week, and again, we've talked about it, it's an El Nino weather pattern. It's a moderate one. Some perhaps think it's a strong one, but it's not your classic textbook uh, daddy's uh, El Nino, if you will. It will have a different look and feel as we get deeper on into the winter season. But the folks out through Big Sky Country, Wyoming, boy, hold Hold on good and tight. There'll be a healthy wind. This downslope wind, this snow eating wind uh, and of a Pacific origin. We'll get some gusts up there here through parts of Montana, Wyoming. Would be surprised we get some hurricane force winds through some of those mountain passes. But remember for folks in the engine shop, you compress a gas, you warm it up. Same applies to the atmosphere. That's why we're going to flood much of the areas into the plains and Midwest with very mild weather. A couple of systems coming ashore and some pretty significant moisture banked up across the Cascades, Northern Sierra and the bitter 
tighter root chain here of late, and uh, that pattern continues on. Matter of fact, pretty impressive trough, this buckling of the upper level winds, so cold air settles on in. Uh, moderate snow levels, but a pretty healthy rain system for Northern California, the Pacific Northwest, and snow across the Bitter Roots, Northern Rockies. While you get into the Northern Plains, a couple of sprinkles and snowflakes, but a very, very mild weather pattern. Well above average temperatures expected there for this week and beyond. Here's some signature of this El Nino setup, a little system down through the desert southwest into West Texas cotton. Arizona, about 85% of their cotton has been harvested. We're wrapping it up across the valleys of California. Note high pressure here, clockwise flow, and there may be a run of some Santa Ana conditions into Southern California uh, through much of the week, but this weather system slowly making its way. A couple of sprinkles and snowflakes in the mountains in Mexico, a couple of rain showers down in West Texas cotton. Otherwise, windy, warm, and dry. The operative weather words back for the plains. Need more rain in some of those drought areas, but a good go of it with outdoor work in mind. Yeah, I was looking at the drought monitor the other day. It looks like there's a little erosion of the drought in uh, that Plain States area, Western Plains. Exactly, and still ongoing, especially through Nebraska. The worst of it, but we saw some rains last week down through Texas, Louisiana, and we're getting some worsening as well in the parts of Indiana and Ohio uh, from about Champaign on southward through the northern end of the state. We're okay, but again, picking up through Wisconsin and, of course, ongoing in the Western Corn Belt. Very quiet weather picture this week. It's a parade of fast-moving upper disturbances. A few snowflakes and sprinkles here coming off uh, the recent rains from the I-70 corridor on southward. Colder weather up towards Arrowhead of Minnesota. Here is a strong jet stream roaring across Montana and Wyoming. There'll be significant warming across the northern and central plains and a lot of wind as well. And those mountain passes, again, will get hit pretty hard. Very windy, mild weather for the upper Midwest. Western Corn Belt back into the uh, areas of the Ohio Valley. Opportunities to hopefully put a wrap on harvest where we're delayed here still through Michigan and Ohio. A little rain snow mix for parts of the western Dakotas and big sky country. That is it and a very quiet, unusually mild to warm weather pattern that warmed all the way into the Canadian Prairie. And of course, the grounds uh, appreciating the recent snow melt, by the way, into the upper Midwest and northern plains. Into the southern plains, a couple of weather systems and areas from about the Metroplex on southward. Warm weather through Kansas. Very mild conditions across the Ohio Valley. And again, driven by El Nino. Here's the southern branch of the jet. Systems will track along the Gulf Coast, the Rio Grande. Here's the northern branch of the jet with another flood max of uh, unusually mild warm weather for Kansas, Oklahoma into the central and southern Corn Belt. I was surprised how much dryness there is in the eastern Corn Belt area. Uh, exactly, and uh, you know we've had some recent rain and snow into Michigan, but again, some worse things have been noted through parts of Indiana and Ohio. Not a lot expected here for this week. I think with time, as we get deeper on into the winter season, you know, typically you think that El Nino warm and dry, maybe a different story. I think later on this winter season, if you're looking for winter, here it is across the northeast of New England, early portions of the week where the weather system skedaddling out of the Corn Belt into the northeast of New England. Here's a warm front through the Plain States areas and. Western Corn Belt, windy, warmer, milder, drier, and again, some opportunities to wrap it up on harvest, we think, through Michigan and Ohio. Again, through Texas, the Gulf Coast, and through Florida, a couple of El Nino-driven weather systems here. A couple of stray showers for the eastern Carolinas. Nice to see last week's rains through Texas, the Delta region, and the lower Mississippi Valley, where there may be a couple of more scattered showers down there, mid to late portions of the week. Otherwise, high pressure extending from the Ozarks into the Carolinas. Greg Sonia is back with his extended farm weather forecast for the country presented by Pivot Bio Proven 40. Predictable, productive, weatherproof. Turn to a better nitrogen. Turn to Pivot Bio Proven 40. Learn more at pivotbio.com. We know some folks are getting beneficial moisture after being quite dry. Let's visit with Greg to see what's in the gauge in the offing for this week. And it will continue to be into the Pacific Northwest, which is a trademark of El Nino. And uh, over at least the past week, eastern Texas, down through Bayou Country, into the mid-south uh, sections of the southeastern part of the country, where uh, we have more moisture back in the forecast here. So some modest drought improvement anticipated. Any sense of winter time here through the northeast of New England. But note how far north the rain snow line is up near the Canadian border, dipping through the northern and central Rockies into the Pacific Northwest, little to none from Texas to much of the corn belt and points on westward. So a pretty favorable setup here if you're looking for more dry time and late late season field work across the heartland. You don't have one of those glass rain gauges out there yet, do you? My old forester friend Rick the other day said he froze his gauge. 
You, do, you, you have a digital thing, don't you? Yeah, but I like the old school days. You know, you go out there with your, it should be a tin can or plastic, you remember, glass and water and expansion and all that. In any event, I'm kind of an old school guy here. Uh -huh. That digital, and actually that stuff that you do measure in person with the ruler is far more accurate, according to my friends at the big government weather agency. Oh so my goodness. Don't tell anyone. I don't have tell, no idea. Don't tell anyone. Here we go uh, with a big warm up for, for the eastern half of the country. It's a progressive weather pattern. We're not locking in to these cold air intrusions, uh, nor any super long term warm. Note the jet stream pattern in from the southwest, so we have a little more moisture showing on up where we actually need it. Southwestern parts of the country, the plains across areas of the Corn Belt and upper Midwest, including some snowfall, so a little more drought improvement, we think, in the hmm. weeks to come. In that last full week ahead of Christmas, will it still be warm in some spots? It will over sections of the uh, far west and northwestern part of the country. Winter time as of the 21st, 927 in the evening, uh, central time, a little warmth over the southeastern part of the country. Here's that trough position and just a little prod of some colder air into the upper Midwest, but it is a progressive weather pattern. So the moisture here moves into the Ohio Valley, the northeast New England. Yeah, probably some snowfall expectations of more moisture too, max for the worst drought areas of Texas and Bayou country. And that last full week of 2023 as we head toward the new year, will there be still some abnormally warm areas? There will be. Here it is from wow. about the Missouri on westward. This will be on the move as well here into probably very early January, but not the way the rest of the whole winter season goes. I'll look at a push of some cooler air over the northeastern part of the country. And if you have holiday travel plans in mind, a very quiet weather picture for much of the Midwest, some moisture across the Gulf Coast. Next on This Week in Agribusiness, it's Max's Tractor Shed, spotlighting another great American tractor. Every autumn for a few years now, we've featured those auger tractors. Maybe their days in the sun are past. They're not a big tillage tractor anymore, but they're still doing duty out there as an auger tractor at the grain bin. We'll talk about one at a Max's tractor shed brought to you by Mystic Lubricants. Mystic Lubricants are made to make it last. Well, the sounds of the season of the fall, as you listen out across the countryside, you'll hear that grain dryer out there humming away. Then you get a little bit closer, you may sometimes hear another noise. You may hear the sound of a good old auger tractor. Maybe its days as a big tillage tractor are gone, but it's out there powering the harvest up into the grain bin, such as this one is. A machine that did its heavy work some 40 years ago may still be reliably employed for what some might consider a lesser chore. But helping store the harvest, as this IH-786 does, is not to be taken lightly. And this IH tractor, with an Elwood front end from Elwood Manufacturing at Elwood, Illinois, was one of just 1,855 786s built. I was told by its owner, Rich Bayless. Now you'll see that Rich also relies on an IH-756 for auger duty. But that 786 with that mechanical front wheel drive is hard to ignore. And furthermore, Rich Bayless describes it as, uh, these were his words, a good runner and fun to have around. They're at Hedrick, Iowa, about 15 miles or so north of Ottumwa, Iowa. Let's see what's selling at Big Iron Auctions of the week ahead. Our good friend Mark Stock is here to fill us in. Well, hello, Max. The week of December the 4th is full of auctions. Van Wall Implement will be selling quality equipment on December the 4th. Folks, the William Babel Estate sale will be on December the 5th by Humphrey, Nebraska. Selling late model Massey Ferguson tractors. Another sale December the 5th for P and K equipment. Items located across Oklahoma and Iowa. 2021 and 22 John Deere track tractors. Also on December 5th, Fawn Brothers are retiring the equipment located in Hondo, Texas. 149 items. And again, December the 5th, Gary Nettleson is retiring 83 items selling by Saybrook, Illinois. And December the 7th, Johnson Tractor will sell 81 items. Late model Case IH equipment. Douglas and Evelyn Matson are retiring. Their sale December the 7th by Longford, Kansas. 108 high quality items. December the 7th, Joe and Lucy Gleespan. Their farming retirement sale by Rosamond, Illinois. 52 items. 
and December the 8th Max, Central Illinois Ag Equipment will be selling more quality related items. Our FFA Chapter Tribute is brought to you by Pioneer, developing new generations of seed innovations for new generations of farmers. Pioneer, what's next happens here. Well, we go to Southeast Missouri this week to visit with a state FFA officer there. Wyatt Henley joins us. Where are you located, Wyatt, to pinpoint it on the map for us? Uh, well, sure thing. So I go to school in uh, Bloomfield, which is about, I'd say, 15, 20 minutes north of the top of the boot heel. Uh, but I'm from the small town of Aquila, which is about five minutes north of that, on right in southeastern Missouri. I'm not sure I've been to Aquila, but I've seen it uh, on the signs as we've traveled in southeast Missouri on many occasions. Do you uh, come from a farm? I do. Uh, I come from a seven-generation family farm. My family was one of the first ones to settle Stoddard County. Uh, we raise Angus beef cattle, and we also do some row crop. We do soybeans and corn, and we have some small pots of rice. Wow, you are busy folks there, by all means, in Stoddard County. Do you enjoy working on the farm yourself? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's something that I've, I've grown up doing my whole life. Uh, there, there's never much free time. Everybody else would say, oh, I'm so excited for Christmas break, which I always was, but that meant that I was going to be working on the farm. So it, it was always fun, but it was very different than what a lot of people expected from, you know, breaks away from school. Southeast Missouri State is where you go to school and where you're attending college. What will you do after you're all done there? Um, well, right now I'm double majoring in agribusiness communications and agribusiness plant and soil science. And uh, I would like to maybe go get my master's degree at a larger university. And then I would like to work in promotion in uh, maybe commodities. So work for Missouri soybeans or Missouri corn and be able to uh, promote and advocate for Missouri farmers on a larger scale once I get done with the FFA. Those commodity groups in your state do an excellent job, and who knows, there may be a role for an excellent young person to come join them in a few years. We appreciate your joining us this weekend, Wyatt. Good luck to you. Best of luck. All right. Thank you so much. Wyatt Henley, he's state vice president for the Missouri FFA from the town of Aquila, Missouri. Farm Rescue. Are you familiar with it? Well, it's a charity that was started 18 years ago by a commercial airline pilot who saw a need to help farm families when they had some kind of a crisis or calamity. Farmers would step in and uh, lend a helping hand, as we often see. Well, that effort has operated in somewhat of a limited geography and scope. Now, there will be a boost from Wiffles Hybrids, the seed corn company. Jill Carlson visited with us about that. Our employees, our seed representatives, and our customers have really put their arms around this and helped raise awareness for farm rescue in their communities. How do your seed sales factor into this uh, service effort? Sure. Is there a link? There is a link. Um, you know, our seed representatives are so entrenched in the communities, and they're some of the first people that hear about farm families going through an illness, an injury, or even a natural disaster. And so they want to make sure that these farm families have the help that they need. So they're reaching out directly to Farm Rescue or direct to the families to make sure that they know Farm Rescue is there to help harvest, plant, or even feed livestock in some cases. Uh, they're making sure that these farm families know that their help is there if they need it. Every farm family has been in one of those seasons when something happened and derailed what they, they, they had had hopefully been a, a tremendous harvest. And uh, so I think many of your customers, no doubt, can identify with that. Absolutely, and it's one of those things, you know, we are all active in our farming communities, and we know that farm families help each other out when there's an illness or injury or something like that. But when push comes to shove and it, things have to get harvested, things have to get planted, you know, we can't always be there to help, and that's when Farm Rescue comes in. So we've also been helping, uh, we not only from an awareness standpoint, but making sure that uh, people are signing up as volunteers because they need volunteers, especially in new areas like Illinois. Um, and also, you know, donations. It also takes money to make sure that the volunteers have the funding that they need to be at these farm cases. So we're really proud of the effort so far. We've had uh, 17 farm cases in our marketing area since partnering with Farm Rescue in July of 22. Uh, we've also helped increase volunteers to over 400 volunteers in the Central Corn Belt and donations are up too. So we're really proud of the effort so far and uh, we're gonna keep plugging and making sure people know that Farm Rescue is out there. 
Farm Rescue, it is called. Jill Carlson with Wiffles Hybrids talking about their boost to farm rescue. You know, in this country, somewhere every week of the year, you see farmers lending a helping hand to neighbors. Uh, whenever there's hospitalization or a death in the family, it happened just this week. I tweeted about it the other day on my Twitter account at Max Armstrong. Farmers from three counties in northern Indiana, Laporte, Porter, and St. Joseph County, came together to help a farmer in the hospital. Jerry Leidinger's last 140 acres of crop were still standing in the field. Farmers showed up with combines, two dozen grain trucks. They brought in his crops in just about three and a half hours. Those farmers learned by the end of the day that Jerry had passed away. But one comment that you heard from those farmers was that he would have been there for them. And they were just showing up to help his family in a time of need. On your calendar, we're looking forward to later on as we wrap up this year, we'll be bringing you our annual Christmas show. That'll take place the weekend of December 23rd and 24th as we go to visit some churches in the heart of the country. One week later, we'll wrap up 2023, visiting with the folks from Big Iron, talking about how things are selling, talking about what's going on to the value of land and equipment and if that's something that's in your future, an auction, you uh, might want to keep some things in mind. We hope you'll join us for those special broadcasts. Thanks for being with us this weekend. On behalf of Mike Pearson, Max Armstrong, hoping you have a great week, a safe week. So long, everyone. This Week in Agribusiness is brought to you by Case IH. This Week in Agribusiness is produced by Omax Communication in association with 22 Creative Group. We invite you to visit us online at agbizweek.com.